It's academic and it's theater, the place where they both meet. We have to be audience and participant for each other. Intellectual practices, historical practices, cultural practices. Have one. Everybody, please. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore Latinos anymore. Work from all around the world. You can come and see and talk about it. It starts out over the thing, you write a bit, you have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. But there's room for it all. There's room for it all. So uh, welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theatre Centre here at the Guardia Centre CUNY and I think most of you have been uh, here already in the, during the day and have been subjected a second time to our uh, self-breathing uh, uh, Siegel Centre propaganda video but still it does highlight a bit what we are doing, bridging academia and professional theatre, international and American theatre. My name is Frank Henschke I'm the director of the Siegel Centre. So welcome everybody to part two of a very significant day. It's uh, celebrating the life and work of Trisha Brown. And we already had a fantastic, I think, afternoon session with uh, four uh, screenings. We showed the very rare uh, 1969 skunk cabbage, salt grass, and waiters, uh, a five minute uh, uh, slice, ex slice five minute excerpt, which we're actually going to see again at the beginning of the evening tonight. We saw then Dancing on the Edge, the 1981. Um, a kind of a, a documentary set and reset the brilliant uh, a piece she did, the version one, and then Eros, uh, which showed her collaboration with Rauschenberg and done by uh, Bert Barr. So um, we have with us uh, members of the Siegel Company. Um, Diane <coughs> is uh, here with us, Susan and Gwen, and we will talk about the work. We also have a, a CUNY Graduate Center student here who was uh, uh, a part of the company, rehearsal director, and also she's teaching uh, uh, a choreography at Yale, so I think it's an important night. It is after the end of the semester, um, and but it was the only time we could do this um, with the Trisha Brown uh, company. They have uh, also been very busy, had many other events, it was the only possible date. So we have a, a smaller audience, but I think on the other hand, this is a a very significant one, and we always see the Siegel Center as a little gourmet shop, which you have to know about. It's hidden, and but what you get there is very unique. It's rare and truly a contribution, I think, to um, um, to the history of theater, kind of a living history and uh, kind of a, a performed knowledge. We just had a talk with a student today here from the Graduate Center Curie, and we talk about the work which we do here. So this is really very, very much in our center, and our admiration for the company is so great, Barbara here also is with us, who, who runs it, and uh, so it's an homage um, towards um, the company and Trisha Brown, and people do follow what we do, even if they don't all can come. This is um, a significant evening. We're also live on HowlRound, so people can look at it across America, so welcome everybody in cyberspace. And we're gonna start uh, with this very short documentary that only recently, I think, if I understand right, was uh, discovered, and not everybody also of the company had seen it, only in preparation for um, the evening, and it is called uh, Skunk Cabbage, Salt, Grass, and Waiters. And before we do it, just look into your uh, pocket and get out your cell phone, and um, make sure power is off. And the evening should not last longer than an hour, an hour, 50 minutes with a QA. and a We were gonna have a discussion here with experts, and then very, very soon we'll open up to, 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 to talk with all of you and then there will be a reception at a bar close by, which is in the program, the Archive Bar on 36 between uh, Fifths and Madison. So again, thank you very much, and let's uh, have a look at the short film.
So I'm gonna invite the panel to come over. This is Diane. And this is uh, Susan Rosenberg, who also wrote uh, the book, where we, um, I think, sold eight out of 10. It's uh, just $20 instead of 40. And um, I think we have two or three left, maybe. <laughs> and in they are already signed, but if you want to have a special dedication, also Susan will be happy um, to do that. But um, let me give you um, the microphones. I'm sure they should already be on. And um, um, maybe um, as in the afternoon, it is a good, a good um, a, a moment for a departure. Something happened in that year, 1969, and uh, anywhere in the world, but uh, also <clears throat> with her and her work. So maybe Susan uh, give us a bit an insight in um, in um, Tisha Brown's uh, state of mind, her work, and where she is in her career. Okay, so um, the film you just saw was an improvisation that was shot at Sargentini Gallery in Rome in 1969, but it's a 1967 piece. And on the same program, Tricia presented what was her first so-called equipment dance, which was a vertical structure, a pegboard, that had projected film. And she and Simone Forti, another um, experimental dancer of the period who was close to Tricia, um, go walking on this vertical pegboard, giving the illusion of looking down in space. And it's the beginning of her use of architectural structures to generate choreographies. And so it's kind of the polar opposite of improvisation. Improvisation wasn't free, it was structured. But yet, um, Trisha was trying to move away from improvisation to invent her own movement language. And the first way she did that was to invent systems for producing choreography that had movement as an effect, and those usually involved walking. So this was a real turning point. And also, in the same year, 69, she made an appearance in the Museum of Modern Art with another um, semi-improvised, more theatrical piece. So it, it is really a turning point. In, in 1970, she establishes her company, and she really um, establishes the kind of structural systems that will carry her forward. I think this film was new to all of our eyes. Maybe I saw it for the first time a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, I could watch it over and over again, but on the first viewing, um, I was stunned to see how uh, the seeds of what was then developed in her repertory over the decades seemed to be there from my, to my eye the way she was using the floor, um, where her weight was. The, um, we're having a current discussion on a kind of um, s certain points in the history of the work where there was more of a, an, a, an emotional backing to the gesture, and then when it, it became more formal or more geometric, and then when the emotional backing, in my terms, came back in again, and we certainly saw that in this um, uh, solo. Yeah, so it is before the company actually was um, established uh, shortly before, but also was the beginning, I think, where performance art or, or dance or whatever went into galleries or in site-specific places like this uh, garage in, uh, in, uh, in Rome, where um, it, it purposely was put um, by, the, by the gallery owner and who said, you know, it's uh, time to, 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 to use the public spaces, the free spaces, who perhaps you know, as we said in the afternoon, uh, some connection of speed and dynamism of the idea of the futurism, the Italian coming out that this is connected um, to, to, to the future of art or the anticipation um, of, um, uh, of future. So um, her movement still, in a way, are almost a bit, uh, um, how would one say, aimless. They are still, she's still um, um, exploring, in a way. It's a kind of a, a, a she's still, still in a drance internal state, but um, we talked briefly about it. Where did she come from? What was her education and what was uh, her, um, her background that brought her to this very space in that very time in Rome? Uh, what took her to Rome? Okay, um, so the brief history is she had a traditional modern dance training at Mills College and the American Dance Festival. Uh, she's she, from Wisconsin? She's from Aberdeen, Washington. Oh, Washington. Home of many important artists, including the photographer Lee Friedlander, who photographed her brother, 
Gordon doing uh, as, an, as an athlete in Aberdeen when he was a young photographer. He just spoke at the New York Public Library about his life in Aberdeen. Uh, Kurt Cobain is from Aberdeen. The painter Robert Motherwell is from Aberdeen. Um, I just learned of one other person, a recently really famous person from Aberdeen. It escapes me. Anyway, she left Aberdeen for uh, Oakland, California, where Mills is, and then she took a teaching job in Oregon, and then she needed to improvise with her students because there was no dance department, and so she went to Anna Halperin's uh, Kentfield, California um, dance deck outdoors. It was the one place where improvisation was happening, and uh, Trisha was wary of it, but uh, drawn to it. Um, she then learned, she met Simone Fortier and Yvonne Rayner and other artists, and they convinced her to move to New York to take a composition workshop with Robert Dunn, um, who had been asked by John Cage to transmit his ideas on composition in music uh, to dance. Improvisation, Trisha told me, was not on the grid in New York. Um, I was told by Steve Paxton, one of Trisha's compatriots in Judson Dance Theater, the collective that worked out of Dunn's class, that in 1962, Trisha performed the first full-blown improvisation that was ever seen in public. Obviously, all these artists were using improvisation, but Trisha um, had a very strong attachment to it and it would find her way to Rome through Simone Forti, who was Italian-born and who met Fabio, who knew Fabio Sargentini, Sargentini came to New York. Simone introduced him to artists and musicians, including people like Philip Glass and Terry Riley and Lamont Young. And Sargentini brought those artists to Rome on numerous occasions, actually. Um, Trisha performed there again in 72. Um, so that's how she arrived there. And I, I guess this was also a period when she was really in transition uh, and, a, and, and a, rare mo a few rare occasions when she improvised in public. And then um, later on, she developed techniques of what she called memorized improvisation. So it was choreographed improvisation. So she would improvise and choreograph it and never perform anything on the spot like you see this. So it's a very, we're all thrilled to, that this rare footage emerged. In a way, as like some uh, contemporary companies who they film their work, and it's on a screen, and they, they redo it. it. The improvisation is filmed, but they redo it. She did that uh, without uh, the, the camera, and uh, this is uh, quite an achievement. So, Diane, when you see this uh, short moment shortly before the company uh, started, you are a member of the company, you were in many of the dances we also saw in the afternoon. Well, what comes to your mind when you see her working and dancing? Uh, it's 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 really in a way a treat to see something so in a way I intimately filmed of Trisha from that far back and and kind of not know anything about it in a way um, and, and try to figure it out the the Trisha's relationship to improvisation is is really strong and fascinating for me um, how that continued throughout her entire um, choreographic uh, career. Um, so seeing the beginnings of it here, um, where I think it's um, most, uh, uh, I think, um, most freely structured, I think I would say. Um, I, I do think that there's structure in there. Um, and uh, I, I think that she did have a kind of love hate or discomfort with it. I mean, she she saw its value, um, but I think ultimately decided that um, performing improvisation was not something that she was really comfortable with um, in terms of um, her company's work. So there's only uh, two uh, dances that were. Um, fully improvised in performance of all of her works. Um, nevertheless, that sensibility is very present not only in the, in the process that Susan described, um, where there's um, phrase material that gets improvised with, and you know, given um, directions and then memorized, but also in the um, 
generating of material, the, uh, the dialogue that would um, happen in the um, building rehearsals between her and the dancer, um, the, the, um, the sort of, um, it, it felt like an improvisation back and forth. And um, yeah, and so it, to me, it's just really I interesting to see the kernel of all of that um, development that followed alongside what Gwen was saying in terms of the, um, the um, movement ideas, the movement invention. There's, so, there's things that are so recognizable that appeared 30 years later. Um, and then the other, the other thread that I find fascinating that we see present here is, is um, what Gwen was saying in terms of, um, what did you say, the, the emotion? Or and the, just on the spot, I called it emo an emotional backing, yeah, like a really yeah. leave, okay, keeping that's good. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and how that, um, how that would continue to varying degrees um, throughout all of her works. Uh, it's more, more, you know, sort of obviously recognized when she was working with narrative in her, all of her opera work. But um, I think we, we were talking about how when Trisha came into the studio, she came with all of herself. Um, and um, whatever, you know, she left outside the door, you know, in terms of um, a recent uh, uh, success or struggle or whatever, um, she was very connected uh, to, to that. So um, that there was a kind of um, fullness and maturity to her presence in, in the creative process. I feel like um, this film also reminds me, we met the other night just to have a little time together and we just started talking and it just it kept rolling. So we touched upon a number of things, but her, uh, Trisha's relationship to lang like language and movement and bridging between the two of them, or I forget how you talked about it. And I realized that, um, that I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that, because I see it here. If the improvisation was uncomfortable, the presence of text was very comfortable, or at least in my mind it was, and I don't know if that's true or not. And right, well, I guess the, the text that you're hearing is an Italian translation of a text that Trisha wrote and spoke sometimes alongside the rec English recording. Um, and it tells of growing up in the Pacific Northwest and a day going hunting with her father, which started awaking before dawn. And she describes uh, making the eggs and the bacon and then packing the thermoses with consomme and coffee. And the, she describes a whole day of duck hunting as a little child. And um, we, you know, one thing I think that's that would be interesting would be to see there doesn't exist so far. I know the, the English version. To what extent some of the movements correlate to some of the story that she's telling, even in an abstract fashion. Um, we were speculating earlier that the fact that she begins in this wet tub um, speak because the text talks about how damp and rainy and and. Uh, you know, wet it is to go duck hunting in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, we don't know to what extent she was riffing off language, but uh, it was it did become an an, an increasing uh, preoccupation in the 70s. The the disjunct between movement and language, and then later with the opera, the the uh, diversity of ways that she could use a libretto as a source of inspiration, which is really quite a reversal of uh, much of the way she worked with language. Yeah, I think I could hear Nascimento and Barca, like the birds of actually in boat or something, but they, maybe they went out yeah, uh, yeah, on yeah. a boat. So she did that and her whole half circle she did. And as we said in the afternoon, this kind of drawing with the water from her dress. Where she, and I, we also saw that she moved there, her feet, you know, almost like a Japanese no actor, but also like do, putting on a typography um, um, on stage, so, um, and it is true, I think also she did work uh, for some performance with Bob Wilson, who was at the time having no text um, at all, and uh, she, um, because everybody distrusted the text, it was the disappearing of, um, of the center, but I think she um, found out perhaps even earlier than he did, you know, it could be independent and parallel, you know, and you don't have to take text too serious, 
is that you say I don't use it ever at, uh, at, at all. Um, so um, what was so unique about Trisha Brown? How, what made Trisha Brown Trisha Brown? And could see her handwriting. And I don't know, I think at least, if I would have seen that, yeah, that looks like her. But I'm not sure, you know, but, think, but still, there is something. What, what do you all think what made her who she is? What are the specifics of her work? Well, um, Trisha never created a codified movement vocabulary, um, which sort of flies in the face of the question that her work is recognizable. Because, well, how do you, how is an artist recognizable if they don't have a vocabulary that's that's consistent? Um, and that's because um, she was one of those artists. There are many examples in the history of art whose work, she called herself a bricklayer with a sense of humor. And um, the idea of laying bricks was part of an idea that one's work is evolutionary. Um, I think that's one of the keys to understanding her identity as an artist is that she always built on ideas that she was developing to move forward. And so her work continually expanded, but there was always the kernel of the beginning in the outcome, no matter what stage of her career. Um, I think, you know, if we single her out from the master choreographers of the 20th and 21st century, um, she was committed to natural movement language, to what she considered exploring the mechanics of the body. Um, she contrived the body as if it had its own logic, which was a, fic a useful fiction that enabled her to, rest again, she was an artist who worked within, well within limitations, and it was like once she found her limitations, um, and then she was also highly systematic. Um, and I would say that, you know, I could, I could go on and on and give you descriptions, but I mean, if I were to try to lay some of the bare bones of what makes Trisha so important, and then as I write about in my book, her work evolved. She was an abstract choreographer, even though there's imagery in her work, there's memory in her work. Her work reflects on questions of memory and choreography, but um, she, was an a she aligned herself with the great abstract artists of her time, and her work was truly, I want to say, impregnated with the visual art ideas and with a concern for the visual. And so that's my uh, own angle on what makes Trisha unique and different from other choreographers has to do with that uh, alloy of dance and visual art that you find in so many of her pieces which cross-reference what's going on in the work of her contemporaries as the building blocks for her subsequent work, which you know, went into other places. I, um, I can move directly from that. I, I think uh, what made her special for me was when I first encountered her work, I was like, what, what is that? And, um, you know, comparing it to other dance artists at the time, I, I quickly was thinking about, okay, well, you can say there's a certain kind of line in this sort of codified dancing, but what is line in Trisha's work? This is my own um, pursuit of trying to understand uh, her work. And very quickly, I, you know, read about line, visual artists talking about line, and made that parallel. Um, and found out more specifically about the artists that she was um, working with um, in her era. But finding um, writings maybe from uh, you know, early 20th century Russian artists like Rochenko who talked about line is not just the framework or the skeleton, but line is also like cut or intersection or, and these simple ways of, of thinking about line, I immediately was able to look at her material um, uh, from those, skipping between those two media, from visual art and into dance. So that's, that's a more personal response to what makes her work special. The way I think um, line exists in Trisha's work, and it's so, so ever-present, um, because she is this combination of visual artist and wild, intelligent mover. <laughs> 
Um, it's it, line is inhabited through direction, direction of movement. It's really all about movement. So uh, when you see those um, in, in that dance, the the uh, her body cantilevered out from her her foot stretched out on the floor. That's a, a, an exquisite <laughs> diagonal line from head to foot. That it's about action um, and direction and. Um, and, and um, just something that, a connection I made earlier, which I often find that happens in Trisha's work, that there is this so-called logic, um, physical logic also, um, I feel, uh, can oftentimes be applied to her greater choreographic process. So um, her um, movement invention coming from uh, a, a recurring uh, method that she would use would be to to launch a physical action, a direction, and then allow the body to resolve it in its logical way. And I feel like um, that can be applied in many ways to, to, if you take a step back and look at how she would approach each dance, she would come to it with all of her research from previous dances, um, have a desire of a direction to go in, have it a really clear um, direction to start with, and then would um, never dictate the end point so that she was guaranteed discovery. Um, it was all about exploration and going beyond what she could see, what she could figure out in advance. So that was just really, really exciting to be around. <laughs> Well, maybe you can tell us a bit, what are those themes or, of, of eras or, or reset one? What were the different, because we, it came through in the films in the afternoon that she was exploring ideas, like philosophical, in a way, because she, she was, what were the different themes and are there, is there an evolution in her work? I mean, one, one thing that, um, uh, you know, if we, earlier this afternoon we saw Set and Reset, from 1983 and then Astral Convertible from 1987, 89. Um, lots happened, a lot, a lot happened in between those two dances. And the, if you look at them, they're, at first glance, they look very, very different. But one of the things that's present in both of them and, and is, is in many of her, her dances is that she would um, uh, devise a delivery system um, for getting dancers on stage or across the stage. And um, so uh, in Set and Reset, it was phrase material that traveled around the perimeter of, of the stage. In um, Astral Convertible, it was a phrase that um, uh, lines of unison dancers that would just continually uh, travel across the space. and. Um, once she had that delivery system, then, then it was like a machine. It was a mechanism, and she didn't have to, you know, she could just rely on it to deliver other dances internally within that and in contrast to that. So that's just one structural thing that she would. She liked um, playing with the, the proscenium frame, you know, as a visual artist. The space that, that she was creating the work for was, was really prominent in her thinking. So, um, you know, what is it that she said that she felt sorry for the parts of the stage that were, were not used. So, you know, she had dancers flying or walking on the back wall, referencing her earlier equipment dances. Um, um, a dance um, from the cycle called uh, Back to Zero, um, uh, 4A, 4A, um, she played with uh, a commotion on the edge of the stage where she would, whenever someone was trying to exit or when someone was trying to enter, there would be a, a little sort of interference or play with that um, from a dancer off stage or whatever. So there was, you know, she was really bringing your attention to, to that edge on stage, off stage. And then a dance following that for MG the movie she went in the exact opposite direction and, and tried to direct the audience's eye, which she was extremely aware of how to do that, um, 
to that side of the stage so she could sneak someone in over here. And it was, uh, the dance was constantly um, basically sneaking people on and off stage. So she just was like, okay, I played with that, now, now let me play with this. <laughs> Um, so how did uh, how did you how did the rehearsal process look like for a piece over what period of time where did you rehearse when where would it open and what were runs how how did a New York uh, choreographer in that time work what were the conditions um, I was just trying to remember this that that um, and I think that it changed over time of course. But I think the, the m most of the rehearsal day, the, the day would always start with the creation of new work. Like at 10 o'clock in the morning? Um, it, or like yeah, how long? It, and uh, uh, how like long? basically 12 to 6. Right now we're 11 to 5. You know, that's changed, you know, shifted forward. But basically a six hour day, five days a week. Um, and it would, you know, we break it down usually into three chunks of time, three sessions. and. Um, when she was choreographing, the first two sections were um, devoted to the creation of new work, and then the, the end of the day would be um, devoted to repertory and, um, and either um, you know, reviving something or, or just keeping all of the repertory going. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, she would come in, either come in with phrase material that she made on her own, you know, th that happened more in the earlier years, and teach that to the company, or starting in 1984 really was when she first um, sat and directed to generate phrase material on her dancers. Um, I don't know, do you want to add anything? I just thought, um, there's still not a company class, is there, or maybe variations? Because I just thought it would be worth saying for a large portion, if not the whole existence of the company, there's no company class before rehearsal, where I don't know if I can name any uh, huge companies. That, you know, so that's just worth noting. Yeah. The dancers ha prepare on their own, knowing what they're getting into. I think it's notable. <laughs> and I, in more recent years, I think, um, especially as um, you know, Trisha's moved on. Um, uh, we've, and, and you know, the, the dancers currently in the company, none of them have had direct contact with Trisha. Um, so we feel, Carolyn Lucas, who's my colleague, um, feel the importance of, of um, trying to maintain this um, approach to movement that is very specific when and applied to a great deal of freedom. <laughs> um, so um, there has been more and more of an effort at the beginning of the rehearsal day to have there be um, running of shared phrase material. Um, we have gone through periods of time where we have um, alumni come in and teach a class. Um, and, uh, but it's not, it's, it, as Gwen said, it's not something that we have on a regular basis because there is not a codified technique. And phrase means kind of a set of movements, like in a, in a language, uh, so that's a phrase that she came up with, and you like a DNA sequence, which you <laughs> keep repeating. So let's say for Reset, uh, which is such a highly complex, at least from the outside, uh, piece, which looks improvised, but is choreographed to the very la last little movement, um, how, how long did it take to produce and, uh, and Maybe talk also about you might redo it, but how long at the original rehearsal times? You had a loft, and um, then it opened at BAM, or how how did it work? Uh, I I think that let's see, um, Son of Gone Fishin premiered in '81, and I always look to Susan when I try to say a year, <laughs> and uh, and Set and Reset was '83, so that was a two-year span of time. For two years, you worked on one piece. Well, we also did a lot of touring. Mm -hmm. And and there was a little bit of time off in there, <laughs> um, just a little. Um, but um, yeah, I mean that that was that's the other thing that um, was just made working with Trisha such a pleasure is that she really insisted on having the time that was required to be able to explore and say no to what was happening <laughs> and say. No, you know, to keep looking, not you know, not take sort of the easy way, 
and um, because I was, you know, telling these guys there would be so many times where I, in a in a building rehearsal, where I would see dancers do something, and I would just be like, "Oh, that's so beautiful!" And then Trisha would keep keep going, and you know, leave it to the wayside, <laughs> and I'd just be like, "But it's so beautiful!" But then always, when it did land where it landed, I was like, "Oh yeah, that's that's right. That's exactly what needed to happen." <laughs> So, so that takes time. You have to, you have to be able to edit. <laughs> yeah, I think we mentioned it earlier in the day from the end of her school, I mean, she did her last, whatever, master class at her university, till that performance in Rome, where it was 10 years of work and research uh, went, um, went into that work. So could one say, is there a, oh, no, is there a philosophy of uh, the Trisha Brown's teaching of her as a teacher, she also was an educator. It was important to her. Or the, uh, in her choreography, is there um, something you could, one could detect? Uh, well, I mean, I, I've written about her as a, um, a choreographer whose work investigates the very questions and constituents of choreography as an art form. Um, so, um, like when Diane was talking about the importance of s delivery systems on the stage, that's actually where she began with creating the delivery system was this famous work called Man Walking Down the Side of the Building. And the building gave her the system and the structure and the duration and the act itself. And so in, you know, where most choreographers would begin inventing movement you can see Trisha's inventing movement and improvisation, but I would say that uh, however um, exciting those performance opportunities were for her, they were a dead end at the time until she started to ask, what is choreography? And choreography initially was just a simple thing as a walk down the side of the building and all of the different uh, in, in, things that that involved, which in, include physical memory, because you have to remember what are all the small movements that the body makes to pantomime a walk. It involves gravity and working against gravity. And from that, she discovered gravity as a choreographic principle that she could carry forward with her. Um, and so she talks about a systematic exploration of choreography, then gesture, then movement, and then dancing. And when she gets to dancing in 1978, she's ready to go to the stage. And so that's my, um, my ABCs of Trisha Brown's um, uh, concerns, which were you know, similar to the concerns of artists who, of her generation who were questioning, you know, what are the constituents of art? And do they have to be visual? And, and do they have to take place uh, in a frame, or it, do they have to be a commodity? And, and I think that Trisha was similarly asking these questions, but in, but in, in, in a very systematic uh, and, evol as I said, evolutionary um, fashion. But I also think that um, the other principle that makes her work so stunning and different, and, and that I failed to mention earlier, is that um, watching Trisha perform and watching her dance perform, the principle that I'm not just making beautiful movements and shapes with my body, but you can actually see my mind thinking and my body thinking while I dance. She managed to infuse her work with, whether it was by doing extraordinary acts of coordination, by talking while performing, by talking while performing two dances simultaneously and alternating between two stories simultaneously. She, she continually showed you that dance is an entertainment, dance involves the mind, and the body has a mind of its own. I took a composition class in 1991 from Trisha. The company was in residence at Skidmore College, and I was a young dancer, and I don't think she gave many composition classes. I went back as I was preparing to be here, I went back to see if I could find any notes from that workshop, and I found some scribbles, and um, there were two things that, that I had jotted down, and, sh and one was, Trisha said that, um, isn't it funny that people think they can make a dance based on a musical score? 
And then the other one was she had given us a, an exercise. In my notes, I called it wall as score. I, I think I later realized that she was referring to the, uh, the 1966 inside dance, where she read the visual information on the wall in order to um, translate that into movement. Uh, but what an incredible composition exercise. Um, but, but under next, I put Wallace score, and then and she, you know, she said the simple thing, like, don't, don't worry that it has to look like a dance. Just be true to what you see. And so, so there you go. And I just feel like those two statements um, um, really um, explain a lot of how she worked. Interesting that, you know, the question about a philosophy, I don't know if, like, what we're talking about is so much a philosophy, but, um, you know, I just finished, I just wrapped up a, a project uh, uh, working at Sarah Lawrence um, and uh, with uh, uh, material from both Set and Reset and Lineup. And um, the, uh, when we got into performing what was made, um, I feel like a lot of this whole um, philosophy almost or approach it becomes really all of a sudden that it's like, okay, this becomes really important in terms of how do I show this? How do we, how do we share this? And um, I think that what you're saying is, is uh, this um, authenticity, you know, that that, that, that was such a, um, such a, 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 a given in, in how she would um, engage you in the choreographic process or how, um, she would ask you to perform or how she herself would perform. I mean, spending the afternoon with these videos and seeing those um, wonderful close-ups of, of performers' faces and, and Trisha's face as a performer and, and the, um, that there's no, um, there's no hiding. <laughs> um, there's nothing obscuring the intelligence of uh, and, and and the the focus of of uh, and, uh, and the difficulty actually of what what she's trying to do. I think one of her trademark, if if I understood right, is also m observing everyday movement and somehow incorporating them. I think also at the Whitney, I think her son talked when they would walk down the street, everything would be in a way a game or they would reproduce uh, movements they saw, and often one had the feeling that uh, contradicting forces were moving her, like even in that, what you would say, the phrases, you know, they were uh, the body finishing thinking thoughts as a body, but often the movements feel like forces are pulling her from different sides, but she was still in control of it. But they are, were kind of everyday, or traces of everyday movement. So would you, would dancers bring movements? Would she observe them, or would she even mention that, or? I think all of the above. <laughs> yeah. She worked, um, as we, we could see in the video, she worked with Rauschenberg, Laurie Anderson, uh, Robert Ashley, in a way, continuing a tradition that what Diaghilev did uh, with uh, the Ballet Russe. You know, they had the Picassos and Matisse's working. It was a very new invention from him at the time. Nobody had ever done that. And I think most probably also at that downtown, it was most probably also not yet a practice, was that, uh, who was interested? Was it Rauschenberg who came to her? She knew, knew how do they knew each other through a gallery, or how, 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 what was the story of that close-knit collaboration they had? Um, well, uh, the funny story that Trisha told about meeting Rauschenberg was that she had a uh, work-study position answering the telephone at the Merce Cunningham studio when she first moved to New York, and this funny man named Robert Rauschenberg would call up and they would have these hilarious conversations and she finally asked who he was and went up in 1963, he had his famous Jewish Museum retrospective exhibition. She realized he was like a major artist. Um, Rauschenberg participated in Judson and actually um, he, he started, he, he made a, um, some dances um, with members of Judson. He was very close to Steve Paxton for a period. They lived together. And um, so Trisha was part of that. He went on, took part of the Judson group on a tour. And then, um, of course, he had been Merce Cunningham's artistic director until 1964, from 58 to 64, I believe the dates are, and uh, until they had a break. And Trisha always answered when she was asked. She said, I was 
invited to be on the stage and everyone asked, what are you doing for costumes? What are you doing for lighting? And she said, so I just called Bob because he was the man. He'd worked for Merce. Um, but obviously they had a, a great rapport uh, that had developed over all those years. And she would describe, um, I've heard her describe their communication as almost telepathic, that, that they would, and I think it had to do with the fact that, and this is where I would say, yes, it's in the tradition of Diaghilev and you know, Cunningham and Cage, but Trisha really directed her collaborators. She gave them the seeds of her choreographic ideas. She oriented them to the idea that she was working within the proscenium context and that was an actual non-illusionistic non place for her. And she would you know, meet with them and there would be an exchange back and forth. There was no surprises when anyone got on stage. Everything was very carefully orchestrated and by Trisha. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, I mean, even so, we do know it, but, you know, to really be reminded that influences were contemporary visual artists, you know, it was not ballet, it was not, you know, uh, traditional theater or Broadway dances or whatever, there was uh, proximity to galleries and to visual artists, installation art, performances, and that made uh, that in New York performance scene so, so unique and now legendary in a way, but um, she, she, we lost her. Um, this year, and how does the company cope with it? Is it teachable what she did? What are the plans? What are, what are you going to do? Well, we just had an incredibly successful season at the Joyce. <laughs> yeah, you got to see it. <laughs> We're looking good, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah. It was a big surprise, frankly. I was afraid. Okay. But, but I loved it. And, oh, great. And the audience, I was there Friday night, the audience just stood up. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I think it was an unequivocal success. And, uh, and um, yeah, I'm glad you saw it. Um, and I can understand if you care about the work that you would be concerned. <laughs> and I'm glad that you saw that, that we're doing well. Um, so yes, there's um, still interest in the work, and and you know the interest also coming from young, extremely talented dancers who who continue to to find the work very relevant and enriching, and um, and uh, that I think is a, a big uh, vote of confidence <laughs> to um, carry on. Um, uh, I I. Th feel strongly that um, the work needs to um, find uh, more of an educational home, um, that uh, the, um, I think that the, that the dance world has been really um, very uh, influenced in a positive way by Trisha's work, but I don't know that the dance world really recognizes that. And I think until we can um, reach more people with more clarity about really what Trisha's contribution is and has been to dance, um, I'm concerned that 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 um, the that we can't build on that that that, that dance can't progress as, as as strongly as 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 it could. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means, honestly. You know, what shape is that going to take? I don't know. But um, uh, it's clear that um, people are interested in the work. Um, artists are using it, and not just dance artists, not just choreographers, but um, artists in other medium. And um, and uh, I just uh, would love to continue to. Um, figure out how to make her ideas as accessible as possible and as clear as possible. Um, we have an extraordinary archive that, um, that uh, uh, hopefully would be part of that <laughs> and um, you know, are, are in the process of, of figuring out where, where that will go and, and um, how it can be best used. But it's uh, an incredible um, uh, resource and documentation of, of her, all of her um, work. I know that uh, for the Graham Company or Cunningham or Pina Bausch, they uh, all had 
kind of directives. You said she did co direct her collaborators very, or you said that earlier, very strongly. Did she give you indications? What were her ideas or visions of, did she ever yes, she formulate did. something? Yes, I mean, it, they were clear, n not very detailed, but, but clear. Um, she wanted the work to be performed as long as there was interest. Um, she wanted the archive to be placed in a way that um, would, where it would be used and accessible. And she did want um, her work placed in an um, education context in the US in the way that it's um, firmly established in different European um, settings that, that, that had yet to be found. And, and I'm very um, committed to realizing that. Maybe after uh, my uh, my question, talking too much, even though it's not um, you know directly in our field, and also at the Siegel, we don't uh, perhaps do a good job, enough job to include dance. We do have dance events, but not so many. But we felt very strongly, you know, to 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 react and invite you, even though it was a bit late in the December and the semester is over. So again, thank you for coming, and it's such a big honor of you having here and just thinking that you prepare for it and thinking it all through is really. A great uh, compliment, Professor Wheely. Thank you, and the Graduate Center and the Siegel Center. But let's uh, open up the uh, the room. Maybe we have some light uh, also for the audience and um, some comments or question or. Um, ideas. So we're going to give you a microphone. Not only that we hear better, but we also are recording it. And yeah, th this follows up on what you were just saying about the company going forth. Um, earlier this fall, there was an extraordinary full day at St. Mark's Church, which Irene was very much involved in. I found it the most moving thing that I have seen since the election of Donald Trump. The most promising, <laughs> the, no, I mean the most promising thing that I had seen. And one of the things that was so beautiful is that generation after generation after generation of dancer came back and obviously put our, they had to put so much time and care into recreating all this extraordinary work. So that's the prelude to the, is there no way to build on that? You have all those extraordinary dancers and, and particularly strong women dancers. And it was so, you know, the, the two lineups where you had all 14 women, I mean, and, and, yeah, and for those of us who've followed the company's work for many years, it was not just moving, but extraordinary that they would all come back. They obviously were, loved the woman and were very, um, very much wanted to see the work go on. So is there no way to, you almost have this battalion of people to help you in your work. Well, and, and we do take advantage of that, or I don't know if there's a, a more positive way of saying that. I mean, we, we are, we're very aware of the wealth of um, um, really talented, mature artists, you know, that we have worked with the company um, back since the beginning. And, and we have stayed connected, as, as you saw, and, and, and uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing, and, and you know, I think that, that says everything about who Trisha was as a person and what she created, what she generated, the way that she invited people into the process. So you felt so personally invested in it, and um, those connections don't dissolve. <laughs> um, they're always there, so, so they're, um, we're definitely um, you know, tapping into all of those alumni who are out around the world and um, continually finding ways through either you know education project, licensing projects, um, um, performance projects, you know within the company, um, there's so much information there, so much energy. Um, so we're we're definitely um, trying to keep it all active and take take it, use it, <laughs> yeah. Comment or, um, or 
question or remark? Hi. Um, you said two things. You said choreographic. Uh, it's a word I'm very interested in. I haven't heard it described. I, a, a pan theater, Enrique Pardo, who's a Roy Hart follower, uses that term to describe his work. Who I, and I'm a devotee of, of his work, so I haven't heard it. So if you could unpack that a little bit. And I was also very interested when you just said um, she brings a very mature presence. And you said whether it was failure or success, I, I had a sense that you were feeling a bit of that, maybe even in quotes like gossip, like about, because I'm interested in that historically, if those two things mean anything. So. I'm not sure what the choreographic thing is, but so I'll start with the other one first. And, um, uh, you, you know, I do feel like I, you know, something that c comes up. Uh, comparing Trisha and Rauschenberg, let's say, like we got a glimpse of, of them today in the video. Um, one of the things that was um, so beautiful about Rauschenberg is that he had absolutely zero editing capability. It was very frightening and exciting and exhilarating to be around him for that reason. Um, and, um, the, and Trisha was not like that. Trisha was, um, and maybe it's, the, you know, it was a gendered thing that, you know, you know, maybe she couldn't afford to be like that um, as a woman in her time. But she was much more, um, I think, uh, as, as free and expressive as she was, and as joyful as she was, and as powerful as she was, she was very careful about how she presented herself and, and, and really smart about it and really strategic about it and was able to fulfill some of, of the things that were really important to her, which was to be um, um, really an active advocate for women in the arts. Um, and um, so what, what am I talking about? Patricia walking into the studio, bringing in, so that maybe, Gwen, you can talk about that a little bit too because that's something, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the first things I think about her is that she's extremely emotional, but I think many people looking at her work, they see it as quite abstract work, but I always felt like I knew exactly where she was um, emotionally when she walked into the studio. And whether she dropped it or not, it didn't matter. Or it, and she would drop it in some ways, but, but I think it showed up physically in the material that she would be producing or the, uh, the material that she was producing. So I think that was part of, part of our discussion. Um, and then uh, stepping back a little bit more in um, restaging works with, with uh, young, you know, younger dancers who maybe don't know Trisha or... or weren't born at the time that a particular work was made. I always looked, you know, at her dancing um, before then going into what really needed to be looked at, but because her, she was just present with all of that stuff, like joy, awe, anger, rigor, rigor you know, um, those are the main ones that always come up for me. And it was present in the doing of the work. We saw it in her face today on stage. Um, uh, and, and it often, in the solo that we all watch tonight, um, that presence would sometimes determine the duration of a movement, like that, that big plie that she did where it looked like she was kind of crying or something, and then she came up out of it and then it was done. But something about, something about that has always been curious. I've been really curious about it. We see it in the, yeah, we see it in the, in the solo tonight. Um, so uh, I'm trying to remember your question, and uh, um, but that's part of part of the answer. Do it and get off it. Oh. So I think that that applied to both just her her you know not just her physical presence but also her emotional psychological like be present but then move on mm -hmm. you know and that do it and get off it is a term that is used often to this day in the rehearsal process. Um, teaching dancers how to fully inhabit a moment of movement and then move on, not embellish it or, or you know, exaggerate it. So, but what's the choreographic question? 
Just the term, I think, what it means um. in your universe. You said choreographic. I didn't know if you had a, if that's a specific language that she would use, or I just don't hear that a lot. I don't know if I've heard mm -hmm. it. It's very prominent in an artist that I know. So I was just curious. Maybe well, it was just. She's a choreographer. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably. I, it's pretty common, like a choreographic choice, or what? Can you? What are some common ways that that's used? But it is. It is composition. choreographic composition. I think what's notable is to realize that you're talking about a different discipline and it shows up you know, in a very specific way, but I think it's fairly common for us um, yeah. without a lot of, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna add to your comments about um, the pieces, because I think every piece is made with a certain um, context and feeling and emotion in mind. Like Geo, very different. It had, was done after 9-11, set and reset, very up. You have new work, which is, has an expanded feel. So like as a dancer, you pick up, like a lateral pass, you use a lot of adjectives. Like it was steel, edge, you know, so you know in what realm you're actually creating. So it's a really a dialogue between the your cognitive self and your mind, your conceptual self. So, and, to, and you have, you can only do it if you are in the moment, can I say? Otherwise it becomes false. And it, false, it's like a stupid word to use. I think about it sort of like, it doesn't become ben beneficial, put it that way. It doesn't put you forward. And in terms of choreographic, I think like the whole, how she constructs, my experience again, like we are all have a different experience in this, but it's like um, how she actually, we call it building, you, you build something, and you build something from what was to what comes. So everything has a linearity in it, and then sometimes she cut. I wouldn't call it, I remember the word destroy, I would call it disrupt, like the certain reason that she comes in, because she loved disruption. You have a common thought or a, or a linear thought, and then she loved to like tweak it to like to get to another thing, as you said. So, and that choreographic comes from. I don't know if you come from theater, which is different, right? But it's sort of yeah, yeah. It's a whole. Um, I I always felt that Trisha uh, was more of a composer or a painter. Like she laid different structure to build it, and she's much more complex than we can ever talk about here. You know, like she has so many levels. And, um, and the thing that you reacted to, I think, about the success or failure, I do think because of the, choreo when you talk about the choreographic, and if you ta take Paul Taylor, who has trios, duos, quartet, and you can actually look at, uh, upon it as a musical structure in some way. And I feel like Trisha is symphonic in her way and she has a macro structure, and she has a ma um, micro, it's like micro, <laughs> I can say, within the body, and that micro structure relates to the outer structure. So it's a very, very layered. Sometimes, very early, I, I felt that she was kind of like an, you know, like this Indian architecture that has a very simple form, and then within it, it's like all these things <laughs> happening within, and that's, um, when I started the company, that happened a lot, can I say. The body gets awakened. <laughs> so, thank you. Maybe as a finishing question to all three of you, you know, what are you, uh, what are you up to? What are your next project relating to um, Tisha Brown? Maybe with you as, are you going to write a, a new book or is there something coming up? Um, and, uh, so. um, well, in, in some long-term way, I'm hoping, my book covers the first 25 years of Trisha's career, and so in some way, um, looking uh, to find digital platforms for publishing that would allow me to use moving images, because the, you can't talk about a 40-minute choreography on the page the same way you can. In my, I've had a limited experience talking over over movement, and it's just the best way to write about movement is to have it running while you're talking. And in the more immediate, um, I'm working on a project about the ground union, 
which was an improvisational group of choreographers in which Trisha Brown participated from 1971 to 1976. So I'm going to be getting very involved in um, her parallel, what she called her parallel life in the amorphous world of improvisation. I've uh, been particularly inspired by Trisha working um, from drawing to movement and movement to drawing and other places in between. And um, I also work with those two forms. And so I, uh, right now I'm really very much trying to um, uh, stay connected to her and her work as I develop my own material. Um, purely just kind of maybe from that sense when you were saying that a lot of dancers came back for the event, you know, really just like what were the, what was the s support that she gave me intellectually or simply the inspiration to study about line <laughs> And, um, and, and to use it at that um, energy, really, to make um, my own current work. Uh, I have some uh, nice, big, juicy teaching projects on the horizon. I'll be in um, Brussels at Parts for five weeks uh, Trish, teaching Trisha's work, and then I go to Hong Kong for nine weeks um, doing a set and reset reset, which is our education um, uh, version of Trisha's original choreography. And then I go to uh, Dusseldorf and work with the Ballet Anheim there and um, reconstruct Trisha's um, Locust Trio. So all really, really great projects. Yeah, yeah, those are all great. And then the sort of like the, the above, below, and in between all of that is, is what I talked about earlier, is you know, continuing to, to um, research and um, uh, look for uh, uh, an educational home for Trisha's work. Well, wonderful. So thank you um, for coming, and I hope it was a little step in that long journey to, to get a, find a home, have a home, or get back home. And uh, thank you all for coming on a cold uh, Monday night uh, in New York and in the middle of the uh, shopping season, Christmas season. And uh, we couldn't really compete with the Joyce, but uh, I think it was still a very uh, significant and important evening and also honoring really one of the great artists, uh, American artists, female artists, but also as a choreographer on her own, she uh, made an enormous contribution. We all know how hard it is to even be an artist and to make a contribution, but doing it on the scale she did is so extraordinary. And I think we all got a little a glimpse on it. So thank you for coming. We're gonna stay here a little bit and then go over to the archive bar. We have two, or th two books left, two or three, and they're, again, they're just $20 instead of 40. And um, so thank you for coming, and I hope to see you for one programs that might be greatest for the next season. Thank you, and have a good new year. <laughs>